Hello everybody, this is Jeff Janess and welcome to our first lecture on geoprocessing in ArcGIS Pro. Now, through the course of this lecture, we're going to cover four general topics. We're going to talk about general geoprocessing, what that means and what the tools are. We're going to talk about environments, which are extra parameters you can set when running the tool. We're going to talk about model builder, which is a way of stringing a bunch of tools together where one feeds into the next. And we're going to take a quick look at Python, which is Esri's current programming language of choice. And it can really give you extra power when you're wanting to do this kind of stuff. Okay, first off, geoprocessing refers to any type of modeling, analysis, or just about anything you could do with any of the tools in ArcGIS. And all of these tools in the toolbox are considered geoprocessing tools. And there's a lot of them. There's over a thousand of them available. There were over a thousand in ArcMap 10.8, and ArcGIS Pro has a few more. So the number of tools just grows over time. These tools can be run individually by clicking on them in the toolbox. opens it up. You can start filling out the parameters in the tool window. You can also string them together in models where one tool will produce output that gets fed directly into the next tool. Or you can run them by command line in the Python window. Now I'm going to explain some of the most common tools here. And in our lab exercises, we're going to use the buffer, the clip, the union, merge, dissolve, and intersect tools. And these are some of the oldest geoprocessing functions produced by Esri. These go back to ARC Info back in the 1980s. Now, the buffer tool creates a polygon around existing features. These are, can be points, lines, or polygons. You can even build a buffer inside polygons if you use a negative buffer distance. And you can only create these internal buffers on polygons, clearly. I mean, there's no inside to a point or a polyline. But with polygons, it works fine. Now, the clip tool is an interesting one. Suppose you want to maybe analyze all the roads in the Coconino National Forest. And how do you do that? You have a road feature class. You have the boundary of the Coconino. Well, you could just select all those roads to intersect the Coconino, but then you wind up with a lot of roads sticking out of the Coconino that just happen to intersect the polygon. And so when you generate your statistics, you're winding up with a bunch of information on roads you really weren't interested in. So what you really want to do is just isolate those portions of the roads that lie right inside the Coconino, and that's what the clip tool does. Now, the clip tool, it cuts a feature class to some area of interest. And this tool only works on vector data. There are similar tools that can clip in a raster, but the, the clip tool we'll be looking at is for vector data. It's basically like a cookie cutter, just clips out the area that you care about. The intersect tool creates a new feature class that shows only those regions that had overlapping original features. And the intersect tool can intersect all shape types. And it's kind of interesting because you know, two polygons, for example, can intersect with another polygonal region that represents that intersection. But you can also intersect the boundary polylines, and you can get a polyline result. You can also get the point intersections where the polygons intersect. So the intersect tool can produce uh, points, polylines, and polygons when you are intersecting polygons. For polylines, it can produce both polylines and points. So it's kind of interesting. Oh, and as I'm showing these slides, we can see visually what happens to the geometric objects when we run these tools. But you should also be thinking about what happens to the attribute tables, the attribute fields, and the attribute values. Now with the intersect tool, for example, when you give it a few feature classes to intersect, and you get a new feature class at the end, the geometries look like what we have visualized here. But remember that the features in the feature class are always composed of both the geometry and a set of attribute values. So how do the attributes get transferred to the new feature class? And the two feature classes may even have entirely different attribute fields. Now, for example, maybe this first feature class has an attribute field named name. And the second feature class has an attribute field named ID. Well, the final intersected feature class is going to have both attribute fields, name and ID. And that's assuming we run the tool the way it's normally run. There's, there's options. But generally, you're going to get both attribute fields. Now, let's suppose that the two features in feature class 1 have the name values of Thelma and Louise. And the two features in feature class 2 have ID values Tom and Jerry. So what's going to happen in this intersected feature class? For example, this little square here would have existed in the Thelma 
polygon in feature class 1 and the Tom polygon in feature class 2. And therefore, it has a name value of Thelma and an ID value of Tom. Now, these tools, including the intersect tool, do something else with the attribute table fields that's worth knowing about. Um, what would you expect to happen if both feature classes in the operation had an attribute field that was exactly the same? So for example, here's our feature class 1, Thelma and Louise. Here's our feature class 2, Tom and Jerry. Well, they both have an attribute field named rectangle ID. In both cases, it is a short numeric type. So there's feature class 1. Feature class 2 also has rectangle ID. They're both the same field. So we would assume that the intersected feature class is going to have a rectangle ID as well. We know that the name and ID values are coming out different, but when we actually intersect it, here we get our intersect. We have Tom and Jerry, Thelma and Louise. We open up the attribute table. We see that it actually has two attribute fields named rectangle ID. Now, this actually isn't possible in a feature class. You're not, you know, the rules are that there cannot be more than a single attribute field with the same name. So what's going on here? Well, if we look at the field view, we can get to this by selecting the layer, coming up to data, hitting the fields, it'll show us the field view. We can see that there is a field named rectangle ID and another field named rectangle ID, but these are just the aliases. The alias, the alias is what is shown to you in the names of the field, but the name of the field itself it for is rectangle ID and rectangle ID underscore one. These are the true names of the attribute fields. These are just the aliases. So even in a case where the two feature classes in the operation had an attribute field with the exact same name, the exact, exact same type, it still makes new attribute fields for each version of it. And those, those get both put into the new feature class. The identity tool sort of stamps in these identity features into an existing feature class. And the new feature class just covers the same area that the original source feature class did. It doesn't get anything new from the additional features, but any areas overlapping an identity feature will be cut along the identity boundary and it'll get identity attributes. So you get both the shapes and the attributes stamped into your feature class. And here's a quick demo of that. So here we are with our feature class with Thelma Louise again. We have these two rectangles out on the landscape. Suppose there's some other data set out there. Maybe I just made this hexagons for an example. Suppose these hexagonal regions represented something important. And we were wanting to know what portions of our original feature class lay within each of these hexagonal regions. Uh, we would want this portion over here to be marked out as hexagon B and this portion up here is hexagon C. But we still want to keep our Thelma and Louise boundaries in there. So the identity tool will just take these hexagonal boundaries and stamp them right into our rectangles. It would give us this region here. I'll turn off the originals. So we have the original uh, rectangulars, Thelma and Louise down here, and the hexagon stamped in. We can actually symbolize this according to either naming system Let's pop over here to symbology. I can symbolize these polygons by the hex hexagon IDs. So we just go down here to hexagon name. We have them all. Um, this one, the pink one, doesn't have a hexagon name because it was outside of the hexagonal regions entirely. Turn that on, you see that. But otherwise, we got them A, B, and C symbolized properly. We could also symbolize it by the original Thelma and Louise names and we see that we have all those values there as well. So that's how the identity does, just stamps these new features into it and brings in all the attribute values as well. The union tool combines one or more feature classes into a new feature class. It also intersects all these features with each other so that the new feature class has separate features for each overlapping part of each of the source features. For example, in this illustration, we started with four rectangular features. After the union, we wind up with a new set of 12 little square polygons. So the geometry here is simple enough, but what about the attribute values? That gets a little more complicated in the union tool. 
For example, in this square here, we get the same result that we saw before in the intersect tool. This square here existed in both the Thelma polygon from feature class 1 and the Tom polygon from feature class 2, and therefore it gets a name of Thelma and an ID of Tom. But then when we look at places that only existed in one of the source feature classes, you know, this little square up here, for example, well, it existed in feature class 1 in the Thelma box, but it didn't exist in feature class 2. Therefore, it is going to have a name value of Thelma, but an ID value of null, because it just didn't exist. This square up here did not exist at all in feature class 1, but it does correspond with the polygon with ID Jerry in feature class 2. And therefore, it has a name value that is null and an ID value of Jerry. The Erase tool simply removes parts of an existing feature class based on a polygon feature. Pretty straightforward tool. Now, symmetric Difference is another interesting tool. It's honestly one I rarely use, but it's been here since the ARC Info days, and you probably ought to know about it. It's kind of the opposite of the Intersect tool. And if you remember, the Intersect tool returned a new feature class that consisted of areas that existed in both source feature classes. Now, symmetric Difference returns everything that only existed in one of them, just erases everything that existed in both. Like I said, I've rarely used it. In fact, the only time I've really used it was an instance where we were curious about jurisdictional boundaries from law enforcement agencies. We were working on a project where people would call 911 from their vehicles in California, and the task was to figure out which law enforcement agency had jurisdiction given the location of the phone call. One problem was that there's a lot of law enforcement agencies that had overlapping jurisdiction. So one particular spot might have multiple agencies responsible for it. And so somebody called from this location right here. Well, does that go to the San Bernardino National Forest or does it go to the Palm Springs Police Department? Well, so we use the symmetric difference tool to just identify those regions that had only a single jurisdiction and that just helped make our task a little easier. And sometimes I wonder if uh, symmetric difference is kind of similar to the intersect and the union and that it's sort of like a, a, a spatial version of basic logical operators. There's ands, there's ors, there's nots. And symmetric difference is just one of those. And sometimes I wonder if they added this tool just to make the full set of logical operators. Uh, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I haven't really seen a lot of people use this, nor have I. But if you have a, a good example of where it could be used, please let me know. I can add it to future lectures. Anyway, continuing on. The Merge and Append tools combine feature classes into a single feature class without modifying any of the geometries. It, it just sort of makes a bigger feature class with all the features that came from all the contributing feature classes. Now Merge creates a brand new feature class, while Append adds feature classes to some existing feature class. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same tool. Um, my experience, though, Merge is a lot less likely to crash than the Append tool. I've had lots of trouble with the Append. The Dissolve tool is a really popular tool, and I personally use it a lot. It combines geometric objects into a single larger object can use it a few different ways. You can use it to combine every feature in a feature class into a single object, or you can select a bunch of features and then combine those into a single object, or you can combine features based on common attribute values. In this example here, I'm showing a county map which has all the counties in the four corner states, and each of these counties has an attribute value that names the state it comes from. If I run the dissolve tool on these counties and I dissolve by state value, then I produce these four state polygons. Okay, quick pop quiz. How could we get this border region, which represents the area that's less than or equal to 50 meters from the stand boundary? There's several ways we could get this, but I started with calculating an internal buffer on the stand polygon, and then I used the erase tool to delete that internal buffer from the original stand polygon. Hopefully you had something similar in mind. Okay, I think that's a good stopping point for now. We've covered the basic geoprocessing tools and basically what geoprocessing is. 
Next lecture, we'll dive into environments, which are just additional parameters you can set when you run these tools. And they're optional parameters, but they can alter the way a tool behaves. And uh, later on, we'll get into models, model builder, and Python code. But until then, thanks so much, and we'll see you soon.